Welcome to both of you. It's great to see you. Um, let, let's jump in and just get started with the, the title of the uh, the webinar today. And I'm, I'm curious, there are folks on here who are probably thinking we want to invest in a brand home. We want to invest in building out our brand home. So maybe we start with the question on everyone's minds, which is how do you actually go about securing budget, especially maybe now with the economy the way it is? Well, I guess I can start on that one. Um, it's definitely a process um, and there's a lot of influencing involved. Um, obviously, you can't just go ask for the money. Um, you know, you have to think a lot about, you know, what problem or problems are you trying to solve? Uh, how big is the investment? What's the scope of what you're trying to achieve? What are the metrics that you're going to measure? Um, you know, if I think about Johnny Walker, Princess Street and, uh, and the single malt brand homes in Scotland at Diageo, um, there were a couple of things we were trying to achieve. You know, we wanted to create a sense of place, uh, a physical presence for the brand, um, capture first party data, and then ultimately understand and drive the marketing impact of the brand homes. So, you know, and then it's, of course, especially in, in complex organizations like Diageo, you've got a lot of stakeholders. So, you know, if it's finance, for example, um, they care about the PL. They want to know is this thing going to make money? Um, is it going to pay for itself? So we had a, I had someone on my team, a fantastic uh, financial person who created a discounted cash flow model that, um, you know, that, that, that finance loved and that set us up for success in terms of the pitch. And then with marketing, um, we needed to show them that it would be essentially a free marketing asset if we can keep it, you know, PL positive basically for them. Uh, and they're really interested in that wow factor and what impact it's going to have on the brands. And then leadership, they're looking more long-term and kind of what's the long-term benefit? How does this fit into their overall plans? In some cases, even like, is it going to leave a legacy for them? I love that. And Christian, you you help kind of frame that up for companies, right? Like, I mean, there's early, early studies that you all do as far as uh, helping folks get that investment. Is that right? Yeah. It, I mean, it's a, it's a combination of things. I mean, first of all, um, sometimes it's a, it's a brand that's really... Um, it may be a, a new asset, right? They're, they're thinking about getting into the space. And so they're, they're often kind of wondering, well, where do we go? How big should it be? Uh, what's the brand benefit? And we can come in and help uh, do a lot of that early work with them to kind of frame up the ask. Um, and a lot of that links to like what, what, um, what Greg was just saying, you know, um, what are the goals from the brand? You know, let's, let's make sure we have some really clear North star strategy on, on clear KPIs and, clear brand benefit. Uh, what we'll also do is come in and we'll look at, uh, depending on where, there may be a, a, a single location that they're looking at, or they're looking at multiple locations or even multiple cities in some cases, or, or a region, you know, where do we go? We do all of that, um, that study. So we'll look at, at the market opportunities. We'll look at how that sort of market unfolds in terms of the audience, how that links to the audience that they're after. So ultimately, who is the audience that you're looking for? How how many of them are in the in the market? What's their their sort of threshold? Um, are we coming into a competitive market like something like, let's say we're coming into the Kentucky Bourbon Trail, right, where we've already got a lot of established players, but where do we carve out our position within that? Um, so we'll look at market and we'll look at audience. We'll also look at trends, and then we'll put all that together in terms of trying to figure out the right scale. You know, how big should it be? Um, how does, you know, how is it going to work in terms of, again, those metrics? And we'll lay out a vision for that. So that vision then translates into a, a preliminary business case that we work with with various brands and um, and sort of their financial teams. So like, Greg, you can speak to, a little bit to this on how we did it at Princess Street, but or for the larger thing, but really kind of then using that on those, those sort of tools as a way to then sort of create a, a nice summary for the leadership team on, hey, here's clearly what we're after. These are the benefits to the brand. Here's the benefits of the company. Here's the benefits to the community. And ultimately, here's what we can do for the audiences and why this is gonna move the needle in terms of emotional engagement, long-term loyalty, et cetera. That's awesome. Christian, well, for both of you, Diageo is Diageo. Johnny Walker, Princess Street is often looked at as like the holy grail of, of brand homes. Um, I know there's a lot of folks that are joining today that have smaller brands. Maybe they're thinking about it, uh, investing, or maybe they've got 
you know, 5,000 people come in per year instead of, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people. I'm curious, what do you see out there, Christian, as far as smaller brands that are jumping into this space that are building a brand home? Have you seen very, very small companies or very small brand homes? And is there, is there a limit? No, I think, I mean, honestly, we're all in, we're all in sales, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, when you look at this asset, um, you know, it's a chance to really build loyalty. And it, that doesn't matter if, uh, let's say, for example, one of my favorite wineries, you know, they only do X amount of cases a year and there's no real, you know, they're not even in, in play in, um, you know, in terms of restaurants or even, even kind of global trade, right? They're, that's not even their space. But it's important that they, they do have an audience, right? So, how you treat that audience, what you do for them, the kind of experiences you create, uh, the the chance to come back to that place time and time again. Um, we see that at all levels and all scales, right? So it's not, yeah, it's great that you've got every once in a while, you we get like a Guinness Storehouse level of experience or a Johnny Walker Princess Street, which are really, you know, in large, large, you know, capital cities, they're there's a lot of urban, you know, kind of footfall, all those kinds of things. They help the high street. There are reasons to do those scale of projects, but there are a hundred reasons to do smaller, more intimate experiences. In fact, we're seeing a lot in that space right now, especially not going for masses, kind of going for more niche, more specialized conversations with very directed conversations with audiences, building membership, building, um, building loyalty, um, and again, it doesn't have to be that level of investment. It could be, hey, let's let's focus on a couple of really interesting things that we can do to really bring people into our story, into our home, and give them an experience that's just you know mind blowing, and that they want to tell their friends about. And again, that attracts a very specific audience back to the brand. So it doesn't have to be all at that level. In fact, we're working on everything from really small like adjustments to existing. Tours mm -hmm. like, hey, this is working, but this part is not to yeah. greenfield projects that are brand new out of the ground to, hey, you know, the, 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 the brand home has kind of drifted from where our, our, our brand is today. We've had a lot of new new pack design. We've had a lot of new um, sort of innovation with where, the, we, where, where our message, messaging is. And that was the case of Bow Street when we worked on Jameson. The brand home no longer actually the, the, the market was so far ahead. And the marketing teams and brand teams were in a different place than than the brand home, and it needed to be reinvested because it was just so out of sync from an audience perspective. People would have an experience in Chicago and then go to the brand home in Dublin. You go, this isn't the same brand. What's going on here? Yeah. So, so the other thing is the reinvestment and the continual way you look at how you how you build for these projects and and think about building that in for renovation and and, and continuous improvement as you as you work out that business case. What you're seeing now is, um, I mean, almost, it seems like almost every brewery or distillery startup is incorporating a brand home into the plan, right? I mean, as a way to generate early cash flow, especially in Scotch whiskey, where you've got to wait several years before you can really sell any of your product to generate cash flow, to generate brand awareness, to be a place to, to bring and entertain customers. I mean, even in a, in a way to get your own teams energized. So they're, you know, they're fantastic assets. And I think that they work at all different scales. And I mean, you know, the key thing is around authenticity. I mean, we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about, you know, do I need a production site? For example, they do making the product there to be able to have a successful brand home. And I think it's certainly easier um, because, you know, turns out people actually do want to see how the sausage is made. Um, but also, but if you don't, you can still do it in an interesting way and you can, you can create, you know, a great brand experience, even if it's not the main place where you produce the product. Totally. Totally. There's, I think there's a lot, a lot of great examples of that. What, what's interesting is for smaller brand homes, the economics must be completely different, right? I mean, if you've got, you know, five, 10,000 people a year, there's no way it's going to be a huge revenue driver for the business. Greg, you talked about using it as like a free marketing asset, if it at least pays for itself. I mean, I'm curious how you both think about quantifying the brand home as a space, um, maybe making that business case to the marketing team. Like how, how do you think about going about to justify it that way? Uh, well, I mean, there's a, there's a couple pieces in there. I mean, I think that, and we had, of course, we had very small, we had brand homes in, in Scotland that had as few as 7,000 visitors a year. And they, needed to 
be profitable as well. We looked at each one as a, as a discrete PNL. Um, and I think a lot of it is just, you know, it, it, of course, as Christian talked about, it affects the scale. Um, when you're talking about, about the brand team and, and boy, I wish, <laughs> I wish we had had any road, um, you know, five years ago when we were starting on this project, because we didn't have a lot of data. Like we had in these single malt brand homes, we had 450,000 people coming to the 12 of them per year. And we knew who they were. We knew which country they were from and we knew how much they spent on average, but we didn't understand like whether or not there was an impact being made by them spending, you know, the 60 minutes or 90 minutes or two hours with us experiencing the best of the brand. And so it, I think that like, and if I could go back and do some things differently in Diageo, I would have spent a lot more time talking about the impact of these as brand assets. Cause we were very, we were very focused on making sure that the PLs worked Right. And that we were going to drive the business case. We knew that they were going to be great for the brand teams, but we also didn't have the data at that time. If we had had any road in place beforehand, we could have been able to look at, you know, what was the, what's the pre uh, uh, net promoter score? What's the post? Are, are we converting hearts, uh, hearts and minds? And then how are we driving post visit purchase behavior? Mm-hmm. Because ultimately that's why you do these things. I mean, Chris and I were talking before, I mean, these things are a lot of work. It's really hard to from the ground up or to transform or even refresh a brand home, but it's completely worth it because of the power of the experiences behind it. It's just really hard in today's cluttered world of advertising and social media and everything else to, to, to break through to the consumer and brand homes are a great way to do that. Yeah. It has that, it has that ability to, you know, they, first of all, people are opting in. They want to spend time with you. They're building a friendship. It's no longer just, I always say, it's no longer just the bottle on the back bar. Um, and that's that. That's the case for like a spirit brand home, but it's actually a memory, a person, somebody they knew, something that they can go back to. And we know that loyalty, like if you create something that's emotionally engaging, which is important in a transformative journey, it needs to do those things. And we, of course, can measure that. Um, if you do those things, though, we know that those groups spend more, you know, if somebody is emotionally engaged with the brand, you know, they're, they're likely to spend lifetime loyalty more like 76%. Uh, there's a recent study that just came out. They're going to stick with you because they know that they have that purpose. They know that brand. They know the, the narrative. So versus like 36% if they don't have that emotional connection. So it's the perfect place where they can't, they're not going to opt out and just switch off. You know, they can't just, I'm going to swipe right, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, or I'm going to turn it off and go to another channel. They're in your, your home. You have the ultimate chance to really connect emotionally and build that relationship. And that's why they're just, they're powerful tools for that. And not all brands, just to be clear, look for a profit as a profit center. Um, I think years ago when we first started doing, I mean, we've been doing, uh, BRCs have been in this space for over 40 years. Our our first projects were with General Motors and Disney kind of working on a brand space at Epcot. And I think, you know, what's the value for that? I mean, you know, GM's not looking for, you know, obviously, uh, you know, immediate car sales coming out the back end, but that long-term loyalty, that's why they've been there at Test Track and and so forth for all those years, right? And they they know that 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 means something because they're creating an emotionally engaging experience. Um, and I think in some cases it's a case of just washing your own face. Listen, if we can just pay for our costs, that's okay too. But because it's such a strong marketing asset for for the brand in terms of building that loyalty and building that that word of mouth, or even building, like I said, clubs or memberships now, um, that's worth it, even if it's not a massive profit center. Uh, as long as it's kind of really dialing in and, and serving on some other KPIs that are important for the for that organization. It's not a one size fits all at all for um, one size fits all approach. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the small ones, the small ones, you can even be, you can create a more intimate experience, right? There's an opportunity, there's more depth. You, you typically have smaller groups, you know, you're meeting the makers oftentimes, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the people that are behind the scenes. Um, and so you can you can be even more powerful with what you do there in those kinds of spaces. That's awesome. Uh, along that line of thinking, um, Christian, you talked about differentiation in somewhere, let's take Kentucky Bourbon Trail, right? There's more and more distilleries. We work with the vast majority of them currently, but you know, how do you think about differentiation, right? How do you think about if you're creating a brand home and you're a CPG product, 
differentiating and really standing out and breaking through and, and building that emotional bond with the right kind of consumers? Well, as a storyteller, I mean, for me, it always comes down to, you know, finding the heart of the audience and finding the heart of the brand and figuring out where those come together in terms of what the narrative will be. And, and that it's authentic. It's not something that's made up. You know, we're working with new brands, you know, that are right straight to new to market. And we're building that brand ethos and story from the beginning, that brand personality. So it doesn't matter if it's a new brand, you, you have to have you know, we know that storytelling and emotional engagement is the thing that you need. And if I would say, if you don't have that, then um, we, we need some work to be done. But, but you know, for example, like we're working currently right now with, um, with a couple of groups in Kentucky, and one of them is the, the Horse Soldier team. Um, you know, great. Uh, they were the first uh, Special Forces team in Afghanistan after 9-11. And, um, you know, they, they've dedicated their life to, to creating... Um, you know, and a, a great, a great bourbon um, and, and a series of other whiskeys that they're working on. And, you know, they've got a great story and uh, we feel like we can tell that story in a really dynamic and unique way that's emotional and engaging and actually something that's not currently on, on in Kentucky at all. Uh, in fact, we, we see a lot of opportunity in green space, so to speak, uh, in that, in that market to do some new things, um, you know, so I think there's lots. It it always comes back to the story, and the strength oh. of the brand. Yeah, I, I think that's great for for the kind of the, the creating it and and, and uh, improving it. I'm I'm curious from from both of you, like what are the elements to a very successful brand home? You know, a what does that look like? What's the ideal type? I mean, for folks who are listening who may run brand homes, they might be thinking like, how do I make sure that I'm, I'm optimizing the space and optimizing the time, this valuable time that I have with consumers? What are you seeing are like the most, the parts of the most successful brand homes and like how, how could maybe folks make sure that they're including those? You wanna go first on that one, Christian? Or do you want me to? Uh, or it, you can go first. Uh, I mean, I you know we we use some of the same language on this, and I can't remember whether it came from BRC or whether it was. We we always talked a lot about balance, right? Um, and that you've got you know that you've got the commercial, which of course a lot of this call is about the commercial side of it, about the business case behind it, but also the brand needs. Like, what what are the brand objectives for the for the brand home? But if it's all brand, if it's like brand hitting you over the head, then that might not be interesting to your guests. And then also community, right? That involves everything from sustainability, accessibility, uh, your neighbors, um, your, your, your local government, um, local businesses that might be around you, all of those, those people. So think of these as all things that need to be in balance. And so I think that a, a great brand home, now, of course, the center of all of that is the guests and the consumers. So if you're not quite sure whether to lean commercial or brand, then always think about what would our guests, what would our consumer want? And then I think you're going to be in good shape um, in terms of what you do. But that's what we always looked at as well as kind of making sure that we were hitting on all of those things in the right way. Yeah, I would say like uh, a friend of mine just wrote this new book that we released yesterday called Immersive Storytelling. Her name's Margaret. And um, she, um, she used to work for BRC and then she went and created Galaxy's Edge. Um, she was the writer for that, for that big sort of immersive, talk about immersive experiences. That's, that's like ultimate engagement. Um, but, you know, what she said is, and it's true, is there's not a one way to do a story and there's not one way to do a brand home. There, there, it, it really does depend in, in here, you know, the critical factor is the audience, right? And really understanding who that audience is and what they're looking for and understanding that you may have to have different experiences. The one thing I would say is, you know, you may not just have a singular experience for people that you really need to look at how I'm going to create differentiation, even within, within my frame of audiences that are coming. Uh, I might have some connoisseurs or serious beer drinkers, right? Or I might have people who are just kind of entry level. They don't know us at all. And they need to sort of the story. So it's really figuring out who you have that's coming. But then the other two critical factors are really that you, you can't, underestimate is, is hospitality and that cultural training. Um, at the end of the day, and this is why we spend so much time, when we're, as storytellers, we train everybody um, through, through these experiences because you have to have this level of hospitality. And oftentimes um, it, that really starts with culture, right? It starts with where is that organization sitting? For example, in some cases, even when we were starting work with Diageo, you know, um, supply had a very strong hand in that. And, 
and and how do you shift that into much more of like letting everybody understand that no actually what we're creating here is more like um like a ritz carlton experience of of extreme hospitality and warmth and all those all those little moments that are going to happen so what i would say is um you have to find going back to to greg's point the balance right so having a strong sense of kpis and understanding your objectives as a business making sure that you're right sizing and scaling it to that point so that you're not oversizing it and you can operate it on a slow day with one person, for example. And then that incredible hospitality training and cultural and story training that you do so that people really understand how to, how to create those emotional connections. Um, at the end of the day, you can spend all the money in the world on great experiences. And I say this about Disney, you can do the, you can do an 80 million $200 $200 million dark ride, right? You know, flying through the Millennium Falcon. But what it's ultimately come, going to come down to is the interaction with the cast, with the people that you interact with, right? So you can't underestimate the importance of getting that right and training that and understanding that they are all part of that sales team as well. And that yeah. everything is part of that journey of sales. And then, of course, you have to have something that's emotionally engaging. I, there's a lot of places that you go to and you go, that didn't like if I don't get goosebumps, I you know, I didn't feel something. Make people yeah. feel something. That I would say is more important than anything. Feel a connection, whether that's to a master distiller, some sort of intimate experience, some sort of little reward, whatever it is at your scale, but make people feel something because that's we all want to feel alive, you know. So oh. and especially coming out of COVID, we see that in droves. Like people oh, yeah. are looking for that in connections back for in a big way. Oh yeah. Cool, is it? So in-person experiences are back in a big way. Huge way. Every every concert or event I've been to is packed. Uh, if anybody's flown in the last couple of months, it's nuts. Um, talking about bi- building that business case, I'm curious what pushback you've had from executive level. I, you know, if, if somebody's looking at investing in a brand home, maybe it's not even a new brand home, maybe it's an existing brand home. Um, what pushback have you heard that's really common? And, and maybe what's the answer to that pushback? I mean, the way I'd probably answer that is to talk a little bit about the mechanics of the business case itself. So, you know, there's there's different ways to fund it, right? And I think in an ideal world, the main funding comes from CapEx, right? Because not only, because you, and you can take, you can get kind of creative, right? In addition to the build out, we, we, we capitalized most of the dedicated resources to the project. Uh, we, we could capitalize travel that's related to the project, IT, Uh, obviously like design costs, um, consulting fees, all of that could go into the capitalization. But you also have your A&P and then you have your OPEX. So of course you got to build out the business case that works, but you got to think about like, how is your your cash going to flow? You're setting this up really as a business in a sense. And and I think that that what that also means is that if you can to ring fence it, from what I'll call like the sort of corporate side of the business um, because of the fact that you want to have this have a discrete PL, but that also means it has its own marketing budget. It has its own organization. Um, it's got its own uh, operations uh, element because the last thing you want to do when you're building a brand home is be siphoning off a and from the brand manager. Right. And so like these things I think are really important. So I would say that the, the the initial pushback sometimes can be around, wait a minute, is this going to be like coming from the marketing team? How much is this going to cost me? Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I'm talking a lot more from the commercial side, but I think, you know, Christian speaks so much better about the whole storytelling aspect of it as well. But like, this was a big piece. I mean, in, in hindsight, it seemed like it was kind of easy to get this over the line. Um, it wasn't easy at all. Like we had to, you know, we had to take it all the way up to the chairman of the board to get this kind of funding. But we had a really well thought out plan in terms of how we were going to do it. We even built in, for example, capex in future years. So, you know, the, sometimes people ask, "Well, how do you sustain this? You do this great opening, and it's amazing now, but how do I?" keep it at that same level, actually better and improving five years from now. Part of the way to do that is to plan CapEx for future years so that you can do refreshes as part of your project. And that gets built into the whole model that you're building. Um, and then, um, so I think that's that's a big piece around it. And then, you know, sometimes there's also this, do I, does, should it sit within global 
or should it sit within a market? That can also be a challenge because you want the market to be fully engaged, see it as an asset for, for them building. But a lot of these um, brand homes attract international audiences uh, or at least audiences from outside that existing market. And so you've got to make sure that what you're doing is catering to your audience above and beyond your internal audience. Your external audience is the most important one over the internal one. Interesting. And I, and I would say the thing that Greg can't say, but I can say about Greg is that, <laughs> um, is you also have to have a champion. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you have to have somebody who is willing to really go to bat and, and understands the benefits of the, of these kind of projects in, in, in detail can build the case and has, it has the personality and the relationships to get everybody on board, you know, who really is somebody who can go to the CMO and they get it, you know, and they can go to the board or to, you know, to the head of design and, and sort of say, Hey, this is what we're thinking about. Let me get your input. So having the ability to kind of bring everybody in, which is actually part of the process that we do early when we're looking at um, kind of figuring out, does this make sense? Is it, is it a project? We often will try to find the right champions and the right team to really be able to take that to leadership. Sometimes that's direct to CEO. Um, you know, I, you know, years ago, we had a call from Memorial Pacific and, and it was just that the CEO had gone to Heineken experience and said he, he, well, he followed young people because he just like, he's like, that was his audience, right? He followed these young people. They ended up in Heineken experience. He had a great time, had a bunch of beers, talked to them and then just called us and said, hey, can we do something similar? And I think part of it was this, that he saw the effect of it. He understood as a CEO what it can do. So I think partly getting the champion on board having the right sort of people who can work through that system, be able to make the ask. And then the other thing is really finding a good partner, I think, even in procure, um, as you're model, modeling it out and finding the finance team is really kind of working with them and finding, again, some people who are really smart about the numbers and understand the benefit and are working with you and not against you on that front. You know, they can see, um, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth. And, and part of that is just vetting, is this, are we being too, conservative here? Are we being too aggressive here? Where is that right balance of, of the case so that it doesn't raise any red flags? And that's just a, a process of going through and really fine tuning each of those levers as you continue to talk to somebody and they give you an input. So it's a, it's a little bit of a dance mm -hmm. and it takes some time to really get through it. But if you have a strong vision and you have a strong business case and you can really put the two together and you've got a really clear objectives of why you're doing this, then that often will make it a very quick conversation compared to other things that are in the queue. So, yeah. so yeah, sorry. I, yeah. oh, sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, the, the vision piece, like, and, and keep hitting it all along. I mean, we would have people that would come into the third year of the project. And the first thing we would do was take them back to the original vision. Yeah. This is why we're doing this. This is how it will benefit you, you in your particular role. Everything was catered. And we spent a lot of time on the stakeholder engagement. And, and so and we we're sure we got pushback, but it wasn't really anything that ever got us derailed. It was just part of what we needed to do was to bring everybody along with it. And that's the piece. I mean, at one point we had like 200 different people working on the project internally. It was not their day jobs. We had the core team was like maybe five people in Diageo, something like that, if that many. Everybody else was chipping in because they were so excited about what we were going to be doing. And I think that's the kind of mindset that you want to create in the organization. Like these are big things to achieve. And, and it's something that you can really be proud of. You could look back, you know, five, 10, 20 years down the road and say, well, I had a part in that. And everybody wants that if you kind of create the right vision for them. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about approaching with the right vision. And then and I suppose also per what we we're saying, measuring what's working to support that vision to yeah. continue that investment. Um, we have a bunch of questions, uh, some that were submitted ahead of time and some that are coming in live here. Uh, one of them, this is from somebody who is anonymous. Uh, brand homes seems to be site specific, located at the source of the brand. How do you see these quote unquote homes scale beyond factory sites away from the source? Can you build an authentic experience? I think both of you have, have expertise at that. So I'd love to hear. Yeah. I mean, Greg, you can start, but well, I mean, I was I was thinking of um, I was thinking of your your brother, our Jonathan, our our CEO and uh, and co-founder, and what he would say about this. He would say like, 
you know, if you think of this, so I think what you're talking about is it could be like retail, for example, uh, for a brand uh, that's not at a production site. And he would say that like where retail is going, and he said this at a recent conference, is that you're going to be selling experiences more so than your product. And so I think that's really what it comes down to. And I think it's about recreating it. And, and maybe maybe you're not creating the sense of place because you've got this site where, you know, it's the home of the brand where it's actually made, but you can still create the same level of excitement and energy. You just have to do it a little bit differently. Yeah. And I would say there's plenty of examples of, of that, um, you know, and we're seeing more of it. Um, you know, a, you know, a brand home could be, you know, obviously tied to the home, the home place and where that narrative began. But, you know, we see, we do a lot of flagship projects that are away from, let's say, away from the home. You know, there's no production at Bow Street. They left a long time. Really, production's all down in Cork Middleton. But we still have an incredible amount of people who just love coming to Dublin and having that experience. And um, so they're not, they're, there's a tie, but it's not necessarily as strong as it used to be. But we're doing things in um, other locations, for example, um, you know, that are, you know, because maybe the economics of the home place itself that, you know, just logistically getting there uh, production wise is too difficult. So in some ways there's a strategy to meet the audience where they're at, which is saying, okay, this would make really good sense. Why don't we put that? Let's put that over. Let's do that in Vegas or let's do that in another city. Um, you know, Starbucks has had that, that, that approach with their flagships for years. And we've, we've looked at all of that and we actually are working on other flagship project projects that are not, necessarily tied to, to the home place itself. Uh, and, and again, those could be scaled in, in, in a variety of different different ways. Um, and they can be authentic. You know, you can make them feel that way and uh, with the right sort of design and approach, no problem. I think that there's, uh, people are interested in it. Um, and we see that as, um, you know, time and time again, it, it can work. I, I'd imagine, because it, it's that same storytelling, if it's authentic storytelling, that can happen. Yeah, and, places. Yeah. And I mean, for example, when we did Bow Street uh, for Jameson, um, we always thought about taking Joe, uh, Bow Street on the road. We call it the, the road trip. And um, we they originally did it um, in, in Spain. And now they've just announced that they're actually now bringing it to, I think it's going to come to New York. So we're finally, like after COVID and all this stuff, you know, it's been kind of in, it kind of went silent. And now, now it's going to, you know, we're going to hit the road with, um, with an experience. So it's, uh, you know, and Jameson's doing that and it's, it's a great extension of the place, you know, and, and yeah, reaching absolutely. more people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a good one uh, also from somebody anonymously. Uh, and I think it's super relevant. Most brands are not in the ticket selling business. That, that's right. Right. Like Johnny Walker, if you think about it, they're making a product. I would say most of their staff is probably there, uh, you know, creating the product and logistics. So how do you help them transfer their product business into an attractions business? I don't know if either, either of you want to take that one. I I mean, there's, one. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, yeah, there's, there's a couple of ways to do that. I mean, first of all, you're right. Um, a lot of brands are not really set up to have an operational team, um, you know, or understand the, the ticket side of the business. And oftentimes I think you got to remember a lot of these things came out of, let's say, um, over the years, you know, like this is a perfect example of Ford, like people just showing up at the Rouge and going, hey, we can we get a tour? Can we kind of see what how cars and trucks are made? Pretty much and, how the Scotland thing happened. It was just people yeah, exactly. calling up and saying, can I come? I'm in the area. Can I come see it? And they're like, ah, sure. Come on over. Yeah. And there's that wonderful nostalgia of people that still remember. Oh, I used to go and knock on the master distiller's door and, and then he'd take <laughs> me in it. I mean, yeah. those days, I mean, that's how it all started. Right. And so they were all free. Yeah almost kind of homegrown and, but now they're really uh, a different asset. But to that point, I go back to that, that hospitality and that operational training. So it comes down to really setting up when you look at, as you're building that business case, one of the things you have to say from the get go is, are we going to self-operate this? Are we going to look for an outside operator? Um, there are, both of those choices are available. Uh, mm -hmm. If you don't want to run it yourself, you can actually, there are operational teams or, you know, we'll set, you know, like in our case, like we'll help to set up an organization um, to make sure that 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 team is there. You know, like we just recently did that with the with the Raiders right at, at Allegiant Stadium. And, you know, the, the, the Raiders aren't into uh, uh, well, they're into sales for tickets on game day. But when you're not in one of those, you know, 15 game days a year, you know, what are you doing? So, you know, having to build an organization, you can do that and there's ways to do it. Um, and it's really a choice for the brand. 
And if they don't want to do that, there's another way to do it as well, which is more of a of an operational deal if, if you don't want to have that as your core business. Again, both are valid. Um, we set them both, we've done both versions um, and oftentimes will help a brand actually grow their culture and build their team. And then they realize that they have a, a really great, you know, the, the, that's where the financials are really nice too, you know, on, on that front. So. Absolutely. High margin. Greg, were you going to add to that? Uh, no, I think, I think Christian covered it really well. I mean, it, it did make me think a little bit about, you know, with the single malt brand homes in Scotland, when they sat in the supply organization, they were run as cost centers. It was, about keeping the cost down, you know, we're only going to give out one dram because, you know, we've got to keep the cost on all that. And I think that we did, we did work very much because that was very much of like a cost sort of product driven. And then we wanted to get it to be much more of like a, we even brought in like the Ritz Carlton to work with the teams to think about how to give this amazing service and how to give these little extras, right. Give, give somebody a little extra dram, a nice little surprise, you know, something like that. And, and the surprising thing was, is whenever you did that, they spent more in retail. Um, and so, you know, those things actually, like you'd be surprised. And then sometimes even charging a little more for the tour itself elevates the expectations. And the problem was when they were free, then first of all, half the people don't show up. And then when they do, they're expecting it to be pretty mediocre because it doesn't cost anything. Right. So, and, and, once you start charging like a real value price, like, you know, okay, I'm going to get three drams. I'm going to get to spend 90 minutes with this expert guide. I'm going to learn all this stuff. I'm going to have fun. Then, okay, now you start charging and people are like, the, the ratings go through the roof. They tell everybody about it and it becomes this virtuous circle. So anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. after all, no, a hundred percent. And I think a, a big key to what you're saying is also measuring that to make sure that you understand, like when you do give this person that extra dram, they're spending this much because without that, it's, it's just a shot in the dark. Yeah. Uh, a couple, okay. A couple other questions. Uh, this is from Josh Arnold. Um, I'm most interested in key measurement KPIs and tactics. Uh, which if you want to tackle that, but like, especially when you're investing in brand homes, maybe you're building up that, that business case, what's important. I mean, there's, I mean, there's sort of, there's, of course, there's your sort of, what I'll call the, the, the business or financial KPIs. And, you know, we typically looked at obviously visitor numbers and the revenues spend per head, which is a good way to kind of normalize for the number of people. Cause you're trying to grow that, you know, you want to grow your visitors, but you're also trying to have each of them spend more and, and effectively spending more as an affirmation of great experience. In addition to getting that, those, the feedback and insights post visit, um, I think even more and more, it's becoming about, you know, measuring the brand impact of it. And we've talked about this a good bit, but like, that's everything from the degree of transformation that has occurred, um, you know, in, in that piece, if I really changed hearts and minds, also first party data um, with so many brands going direct to consumer, um, a lot of, a lot of brands have their own e-commerce. So that becomes a fantastic call to action post visit not only you know getting the, the the post visit pulse surveys and the information about how people felt compared to when they came in but also having an opportunity to market to those consumers now that you know what they liked right so you understand who they are like their demographics where are they from how did they find out about it and now you can go back to them later and that's like to me you know where it really becomes a game changer. And, and then also like understanding if you're reaching new demographics, because that was a big goal of particularly for Johnny Walker was to reach some underserved demographics. You know, Scotch whiskey has a lot of stereotypes in terms of who drinks it historically. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing very much at Johnny Walker Prince Street and, and even at single malt brand homes, a very different audience than what the stereotypes would tell us we would get. That's awesome. Yeah. Christian, anything to add on, on your end there? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the the KPIs that, that Greg just mentioned are those real tangent, either the brand KPIs, like, well, how is this moving the brand in, in terms of loyalty or additional lifelong spend and all that, uh, which again, um, your, your system, you know, any road is a great way of tracking that. And so there's actually tools now to do that, which didn't exist a couple, you know, five, six years ago. They just were not the same level of what we have today, which... Is important. Uh, we talked about the business goals already, which are more financial, whatever those happen to be. They're catered to that particular business case and that particular brand, whether that's washing your own face or, or actually 
having a profitable PL and how that all works. Um, but then there's also ones that are, are non-tangible, which are, 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 are measurable, but in a different way, they're less about the brand. Sometimes it could be community benefit, like what are we doing here that's going to help either community. Um, there could be sustainability goals that are part of this a project. Could be innovation goals, you know, like we're using this as a pipeline for innovation. So we're direct with consumer, we're in the space. We have a micro, like we're having a micro distillery, a micro brewery, something where we're actually trying different products and we're seeing kind of what, you know, we're using it as a tool for, for innovation. So there can be lots of different goals. In fact, some, some of the places that we work with are more business to business. They're not necessarily business to consumer. They're much more. And so they have a completely different set of goals of that sales journey with their core audiences. So it, it's going to vary. Um, Basically, it's going to vary depending on, on again, it all goes back to who that audience is and what that transformation is and what you're trying to trying to do with that with with that particular audience or audiences. So what I'm taking from both of you, yeah, yeah, that's super colorful. What I'm taking from both of you is to have KPIs, to have clear goals, right? It might be a little bit different for each brand home, but uh, without that, you're you're not you don't have a guiding light. Yeah, I think Yogi Berra used to say. uh, if you don't have a roadmap, you're, you don't know where you're going to end up. So you better have a roadmap. Um, and you better, ha- I mean, having a North Star strategy and having a strong KPI strategy that these are objectives, here's our clear messages, here's our clear North Star, even here's our clear theme or storyline. Um, those things become, going back to what Greg mentioned, as you onboard people through a process, like for example, we worked on Today, actually tomorrow, we're opening Kalila, which will be the last of the four corners for Johnny Walker. And that was a four and a half year journey to wow. opening. And wow. so if you think about everybody, but the foundation that those early documents that we created together, the foundational work, we always were going back to that, whether that was Greg or we were getting the general contracting team on, okay, guys, here's what we're going to go build, you know? Yeah. So it, it was like, we all had different stakeholders and a role in that. But we always went back to those documents. That was our blueprint. That was the North Star. And there may have been little tweaks here and there, but the foundation was set early. And we just we just drove we just drove towards that that destination, uh, even through uh, even through a pandemic, which was not easy. <laughs> uh, we and we opened seven yeah. projects during a pre- pandemic, so yeah. oh my um, God. not more. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, we're, we're, we're over time actually, but I do want to end with this one question because I, I think it's a great question to, to wrap up on. Um, this is from June O'Connell, which is, uh, what are the things you now know, which you wish you known earlier? I, I mean, in relation to brand homes, you know, in your career now looking back, maybe, you know, 10, 15 years. Greg, you, you want to take it? Do you want me to? Um- you- yeah, I mean, gosh, there's there's so many things. Uh, I mean, and I, I I touched on a little bit of it as well, but I think one of like I remember early on in the project, we we went and spent like fifty thousand pounds on consumer research to understand like whether or not brand homes resulted in people buying the brand later, or whether it changed their perceptions of the brand or the category. And but we we had we were getting four hundred fifty thousand visitors, and we didn't ask them, and we didn't know this. And so I think it's like the sooner that you start getting the data, the the better off you are. So like, don't wait to get the data. And same thing as if you're trying to build a database to do e-commerce or beca- or you want to invite people to local events when they go back home, the sooner that you you gather the information and the sooner that you get that data, the the, the more effective you're going to be in what you do. It'll help you sell the project internally. It will help you create you know a better business case. And it will also even contribute to the vision that you're talking about with all the stakeholders and people involved in the project. You know, I would just say, you know, and the, the, yeah, the key thing is, you know, these projects are long, I often say, uh, and they don't always have to be, they can be short too, but even, yeah. even on a short sprint project, it's just about having a, a, a cohesive team that's all pointing in the same direction and pulling on the rope in the same, in the same way, right? Everyone's working as a team. Um, it, 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 it goes without saying, I mean, and you think that that's an easy thing to do, but I've seen a lot of projects that if you don't have that champion, you don't have the right stakeholder engagement, if that's, if those things are not put into place and you don't have a clear way of sort of getting sign-offs or even confirmation as you move through that process, 
you will find yourself in kind of what I call the surf zone <laughs> from, from SEAL training, which is just being kind of in there and in the churn. And you don't want to do that. You really need to set, setting up your team is such a critical part of success and having the right people who can engage at all levels of that are so important. Um, so, and, and, it, and part of this is it's not a part-time job. Um, you know, you can maybe have some people that are dipping in and out, but because of the intensity of the, of this work, it requires a dedicated team uh, to really kind of help do that. And, and that's a partner with your agency, whoever that is, or who you're working with, whether it's a, an architect or whatever, they, they are going to need feedback from you. They, they need you involved uh, all the way through. So don't, don't underestimate. I think sometimes people can underestimate the amount of work and effort it's going to take to get it done. Um, even on a small project, it's, there's yeah. still quite a few work streams for any little little things or even big things. So right. don't underestimate. You can't run the project in addition to your day job. It has to become your job. <laughs> right. Out of doubt. Which is why which is why you were hired at uh, Diageo, Greg, right? And why they're brand home teams now. Like with a lot of yeah. organizations, they have an entire structure that they put together because they understand how much work it takes to get these things done. Totally. Thank you both so much. This is a wonderful conversation. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day and reach out if you have any questions or want to learn more from us. Great. Thank you, everyone. Joy. Cheers. Bye. Bye.